So this is the Better Resilience Adoption Through User Experience talk, where we are going to talk about better resilience adoption through UX. But first, what I want to talk to you about is something that's near and dear to my heart, ice cream. This here is an it's it. It's an oversized ice cream sandwich that, because we're Americans, we have dipped in chocolate. And it's native to the San Francisco Bay Area. Now, speaking of the San Francisco Bay Area, I used to work at a small little company called Netflix. And at Netflix, we had the typical you know, Bay Area kitchen full of snacks and all that. And there were about two granola bars and one leaf of seaweed. So they claim, oh, we've got healthy snacks, and the rest actually tasted good. So we had a whole bunch of it's it's in the freezer, and a coworker of mine uh, named Mike decided to take not one, but two of these things, throw them into a blender, pour whole milk over the top, because at this point, why not, blend it together into what he called an afternoon snack. <laughs> and what he didn't get was an afternoon snack. What he in fact got was this, an angry blender and some increasingly soggy cookies. Now, all he had was a blinking red LED at the base of the blender, and that was it. So Netflix, as you may know, only hires what we call world-class engineering talent. And Mike indeed was world-class engineering talent. And he knew the one thing every engineer knows. When you encounter a technical problem, you turn it off and on again. So he unplugged the blender, and he plugged it back in. And for good measure, he pushed every single button on the front. He did not get a milkshake. He continued, to, uh, continued with that blinking red LED. Now, as we all know, software is a team sport. And there are others of us in the kitchen at the time. And we saw Mike struggling with his blender. And one by one, we all came over to help. And one by one, we all unplugged the blender, plugged it back in again, and pushed all, pushed all the buttons on the front. The same result. Now, we put our collective heads together, and all the end years and years and years of engineering talent, and we decided, to Google the error message. <laughs> what we didn't find was Blender overflow. That would have been nice. <laughs> what we did find was the answer. The lid of the Blender was put on improperly. and needed to be rotated one quarter turn so that the arrows on the lid aligned. Thus enlightened, our eyes rose from the phone to see indeed the lid was misaligned. But not only that, we saw on the wall behind the Blender this sign. There we go, it's a nice picture. So you can see arrows pointing to other arrows. There's a sentence clearly establishing the problem and how to solve it. And not only that, as you can see there, it's right next to the blender where you'd expect it. So the first lesson you can take from this talk is that engineers don't read documentation. <laughs> but you didn't need me to come all the way over to London to tell you that. So at this point, you probably got two questions in your mind. Who is this guy with the weird Viking helmet? And what does any of this have to do with resilience engineering? I can answer both of those questions. First one, uh, my name is Rendell Kotnick. As Nora pointed out, my career uh, resume can be described politely as interesting and more accurately like this. <laughs> Observant audience members will notice the first half of my career did not go well. I worked at four separate startups, all of which were catastrophic failures uh, in their own way. But I gained a lot of experience, ended up at Netflix, moved to Slack, and I'm now back at startups because, you know, at this point, you, you, I've got to make it. This, is, this has got to be the one, right? So along the way, I picked up a bunch of skills in UI engineering, but also building a bunch of tools for engineers, which turned out to be a weird skill set and very useful. We had a second question. That second question is, what the heck is resilience engineering? Has anyone heard of resilience engineering before? If you haven't raised your hands, I have questions about why you showed up to this talk. <laughs> well, resilience engineering, at least to me, is building systems that remain functional despite unexpected errors. So, I mean, we're engineers. We build stuff that hopefully the stuff remains functional. And the important part of this is despite unexpected errors. There is, in software, the weird. We've all experienced the weird before. Raise your hand if this has struck fear into your heart. <laughs> so we, we know the weird. We know the weird happens. We need to build systems that, that work with that. It still work despite DNS or some random router in Eastern Europe dying. 
But I think there's a little bit of a misconception here. Because when I said systems, I'm willing to bet you all thought about this. Now, I mean, we don't rack servers anymore. It's unfortunate that was really cool back when we did. We have the cloud. And we take our software and we deploy it to the cloud. And that's our system. But there's more to it than that. There's our software. There's the language runtime. There's the operating system. There's AWS. There's all the third party people who are down on the third floor who would love to sell you services. And that's a really complex system. There's an enormous number of things going on there. But that's not the whole system. Because we've forgotten the most important part, the people, all of you. Imagine if tomorrow morning, every engineer in your company woke up and moved out to the woods. They wanted to build their own log cabin and live off the land. They didn't want to write software anymore. How long would your site stay up? Oh, I'm seeing some nervous faces in the crowd. <laughs> All right, it was an hour, a day? You, th you think you can make it to a week? You're probably wrong, but you know, good on you for being optimistic. Because we think like, oh, when, a, when we have outages, when we have problems, we love to blame the humans. That's the only time we think of the humans in the system. Oh, it's human error. It's all those idiots around the blender who didn't read the documentation. It's their fault. We found the issue. But in the heat of the moment, the blender didn't work. And in fact, we have an entire career path now specifically around being the human part of the system that keeps the system working and resilient. It's called site reliability engineering. It's the, you can have a whole life just doing that. So I want to start thinking about, stop thinking about human error and start thinking about this way. The system is resilient because of the humans in the loop, not despite the humans. We don't need to replace the humans with AI ops or something like that. We need to augment the humans. So how does this change how we think about systems? This is the old way. We've got down in the corner, we've got all sorts of different things. We've got you know, the programs and our databases and our tests and our release engineering suite and all of that. That's one way of thinking about this. But we can add in the humans. And up in the humans, this is where all the work's getting done. All of the coding and the monitoring and the thinking and the whiteboarding and the endless meetings, which we may not categorize as work, but we still do them. And in the middle, there's this big, bold line. This is what's called the line of representation. This is because we can't just look at a computer and tell what's going on. That would be great if I could just stare at my laptop, see all the ones and zeros coming down like the matrix, and just understand everything that's happening. But that isn't true. Instead, we've got monitoring, we've got logs, we've got coding, we've got some you know, the, the blinking lights, AWS console, all sorts of things that tell us what's happening in the system. And these may not be accurate, as we've all seen at AWS's status page. And these may not be, you know, show us the whole picture. And because of that, everyone has a different idea of how the system works. You may work in a different part of the company and only know you're part of the, the, all of the microservices, the 1,500 microservices you run. Or you might just exclusively be on the front end and only know how the front end works. And so what I do, and what I'd like to share with you today, is how to study that line in between. Look at how people interact with the systems, how they learn about the systems, and where the confusion happens. Where, where people misunderstand things or don't, and why. So uh, let's start talking about real world case scenarios. As I said, I used to work at Netflix. It's a QCon talk. I need to mention either Netflix or the Accelerate book. And at Netflix, I worked on the Atlas team. Atlas is a, was a massive metrics database. Now, what does that mean? It means that we had, uh, as I'm told, seven bajillion servers at Netflix. We used to run AWS entirely out of servers because infinitely scalable cloud was not enough. And that sounds cool, but it wasn't in the moment. And, we, and having that many servers, well, pretty cool, isn't very useful if you don't know what's happening. And so Atlas, as a tool, looked at those servers and kept track of all the system metrics and the JVM, because you need to keep, keep track of the JVM, but all the business logic and the sidecars and all the other microservices and put it together into this really big database. And not only that, you could query all this information in, in the database and do really cool things like, oh, here's my metric, and then we're going to look at the week over week metrics and then take the second derivative of that and calculate a rolling count of the pre previous hour and then alert on this and that and that and that. 
it was pretty impressive. But in order to do any of that, you needed to write Atlas stack language, which looks something like this. Got it? Easy, right? You just start off with the alert test cluster and the request per second, and then you sum it, and then you duplicate it, and Des and uh, uh, I worked on that team. I can't tell you what this query does. And then from this, I'd like to introduce you to a question that has driven pretty much all of my work over the past couple of years. What are the humans doing? Because there's a whole bunch of vendors who are right here and go visit a sponsor booth, and they can tell you what the computers are doing. They can give you graphs and logs and all sorts of fancy things. What I want to know is what the humans are doing, because that's the important part of the system. So I joined this team that had you know, this complicated database, and I went around and asked, what do you think of Atlas? And some people were like, I love Atlas. I can do the double exponential this and that, and then calculate. And I'm like, OK, we don't need to talk anymore. I barely passed calculus. I went and talked to the rest of the humans, and I got, this, got a different response. Oh, Atlas, I love it. It's huge. It's powerful. You can do all sorts of cool things. I just don't use it. Oh. And there's a lot of people that didn't, either didn't have alerts at all or had used a third-party service for all of their monitoring and alerting, despite Netflix providing that service internally. And that was because they didn't want to do the double exponential calculus, blah, blah, blah. They just wanted to know how much memory their service was taking up. And they had to write one of these to figure that out. So instead, we decided to do something different. We decided to make an alert wizard. Remember software wizards in the glory days of like Windows 98? And you just pop up and you just click next, 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 and then, oh, bam, you've got this, the, the latest and greatest in viruses. We wanted something that simple, but without the virus at the end. Instead of writing this long, complicated query and you weren't quite sure how it worked, we just wanted a box on a page that said, alert me when memory is over 80%. And I could have just said, all right, great, we need to build that. I'm going to go into a corner and hack away and then chuck it over the wall and then everything's going to be great and I'm totally going to get promoted for that. But in doing that, I would have committed a sin that many, many software engineers commit. I wouldn't have built something useful. So instead, I grabbed the conference room, spent about 30 minutes playing with the whiteboard, and came up with something that looked like this. This is not going to win me any design awards. That's why I'm not presenting at designing co conferences. But once I had finished this, I said, all right, that looks about right. And then I went, and this is absolutely critical, and took a coffee break. Went into the kitchen. Uh, oh, yeah, you can, you can take a tea break, too. Don't worry. It's, that's not critical to the process. Went into the kitchen and waited for my next victim. And by and by, an engineer came in and said, hey, do you want to help me with something? And it turns out he did. Both grabbed coffee, walked into the conference room. I said, hey, can you just start at the, the upper left corner and go through and try and set up some alerts with this new product I'm trying to build? OK. Click, click. Hmm, that's not a sound you want to hear when demoing a product. Uh, well, what, what do you mean? Hmm, he says, well, I'm on the security team, and we have a separate AWS account. Where do I set that? Right here, pull up the, the whiteboard marker. 30 seconds later, you could set your AWS account. Fastest refactor I've ever done. <laughs> well, there we go. And he got it, and he was able to finish the flow. Now, if I hadn't talked to him, I wouldn't have known about the separate security AWS account. And I would have built it, and I would have released it. And he would have gone through, gotten to that step, and went, hmm, I'll get to this later. How many of you have a browser full of tabs you are definitely going to get to later? <laughs> it's OK, you could admit it. But that would have meant this guy from security wouldn't have gotten alerts. And it would have, the product would have failed. But we found uh, well, I was able to figure that out just by playing around on a whiteboard. So I repeated this process a couple times. And over that afternoon, I learned so much about how people used or didn't use the alerting system and what they needed. Took all the lessons from that, turned it into a UI. 
Completely faked the entire background. Didn't write a line of Java. And we got something. And then we ran and started running regular user tests. Every Friday, we'd pull a couple people in, call up the latest version of the alert wizard, and put a laptop in front of them. Say, set up some alerts. And then we shut up. That is probably the most terrifying thing you can do as a software engineer is to put your product in front of someone and go. And we couldn't explain it to them because we couldn't sit behind literally everyone who's using our product and explain it to them. And we learned some very, very helpful things. One of the smartest software engineers I know got almost all the way through the process. He had set everything up. And he's right at the last step. And he sat there for a minute and a half, which is an eternity when he was sitting there in silence, until finally he tells me, I can't find the save button. <laughs> this wasn't his fault. He's a brilliant engineer. The problem was, I would put the save button in the corner, and all of the other buttons in the application were in the center. This is my fault. Quick fix. If I hadn't done that, it definitely would have gotten in, gone into the later bucket, and he wouldn't have set up alerts. So this is one of the things I think is absolutely critical for building any tool. This is especially true if you're building resilience tooling for or internal tooling, because your users, all the other people you have, are right there. Just take a coffee break. So the first lesson is to talk to the humans before you start coding. I really strongly recommend doing some sort of user interview test. We just did them weekly, Friday afternoon, grab a beer, try our, try our new product. Now, Netflix, as you probably know, is a fairly operationally mature company. There's, there's a lot of smart engineers doing a lot of smart engineering. What happens when that's not the case? And now you know where I got the helmet. Norse is a, was a startup. It was the fourth tire fire in my resume, and uh, the final one, thankfully. And at Norse, what we did was something called cybersecurity threat intelligence which is a really fancy way of saying, we let the bad guys attack us and took notes. And we'd sell the notes to whoever wanted to hear about what the latest attack was, what attacks were so old they've become retro and are cool again. And the most, you know, probably forward-facing part of our product was the threat map. Has anyone seen something like this? Yeah, a couple of hands. Uh, and then what we showed there was kind of live attacks. I wish, I, I wish it was still up to show you, but I, I don't have that anymore. And you can see all these lasers pinging around as you know, mass port scans from college students in China and all that went around. Problem was, this code base was awful. It was originally developed by a contractor who just kind of threw it together and handed it to us. And then it kind of just jumped from team to team to team as people would add a little bit of a feature and then just go, no, it's your problem now, which is, of course, the best way to develop a code base. In fact, there's a snippet of JavaScript on there that would refresh the page every five minutes. Otherwise, it would freeze and become unusable over time. I guess the, one of the themes of this is memory leaks are bad. And so this finally landed at my feet, because I had just joined, and I was the novice at the company, and made the mistake of going, yeah, we can totally take that on. I was a tech lead, and I had uh, two people reporting to me, and our job was to take this trash fire of a, a, of a code page trash fire of a code base and turn it into something good and add a whole bunch of features in two months. And honestly, we did. That was some of the best engineering I've done in my life. But you're not here to hear about that. What you want to hear about is when it came time to deploy this. There were a few red flags. Let's go through them. First one we've already covered. It's a massive change. We had refactored this application from top to bottom. It was so much better now, but literally every part of it was different. Secondly, we are on a non-traditional infrastructure. This was, unfortunately, 2016, and the company thought the cloud was this hipster fad that would uh, blow over eventually. And so we were entirely on-premises, bare metal. Doubling down on that, we thought Linux was, wasn't cool enough, so we did BSD instead. How many infrastructure engineers out there do you think are experts in BSD? It's a very small number. To make matters worse, we didn't have an infrastructure expert handling our infrastructure. We had me. 
And so the person in charge of doing all the infrastructure work was a UI engineer by trade. How many UI engineers out there do you think are experts in BSD? I can tell you, I am not one of them. Still, following up on that, we were using new and unproven technology, at least new to us. It was 2016, and, and new and cool and cutting edge was Ansible. And this is the first time we'd ever deploy with Ansible. Previously, deploys were just the team would do whatever they did. You know, Jimmy knows what he's doing. Go talk to him. So I finally tried to do something with deploys. Next up, there was no possibility of a rollback. As you probably know, a rollback is when you go back to a known good state. We had no idea what state the servers were in. So many people had just SSH'd in and kind of installed this package or that package or just got things running. We weren't even sure the code running on the server was the code we had in Git. So we had to fix forward. Finally, this was on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> and I know those of you who are extremely online and have active Twitter accounts knows that, know that we should deploy on Friday, right? We should be confident in our deployment process that'll catch problems that won't wake us up on Friday night. Though I think even with the, with the five other things on this list, even, even charity majors would probably admit a Friday afternoon deploy was a bad idea here. Now, with all of these things on the table, you might ask, why on earth did you press that button? Did you go forward with this? And there was one mitigating factor that I think, you know, at least made up for some, if not all of this. This is the last day we'd be paid. Two days before that, we'd had an all hands that said, well, we kind of um, ran out of money. Don't worry, you know, the, the checks in the mail, the investors are totally on board. They were not on board. And so we said, you know, with a deploy, you always say, oh, worst case scenario, we all lose our jobs. Well, that had already happened, so hey, why not? <laughs> Let's take a look at those red flags again. Uh, spoiler alert, it was a complete catastrophe. But why? So take a look at these, uh, these six items, and I want you all to think, which of these was the catastrophe? And I'm going to count to three, and I want you to call out which, what it was. One, two, three, go. Oh, You're all wrong. It was Cloudflare. <laughs> oh, apparently this is a trick question. I didn't list Cloudflare as an option. Well, as it turns out, a while ago, the CTO of Norse had added Cloudflare to the site and didn't bother to tell anyone. So we deployed, Cloudflare happily cached what had been told to cache, which was the old site, and the new site collided with old site, and everything fell apart. <clears throat> so uh, we made the news. That's always impressive. Like, look, Mom, I'm a, I'm a real engineer. <laughs> And there's the map, too. Uh, and indeed, indeed, North Corp was uh, imploding, and everything was falling apart. So what can we learn from this? Well, I mentioned earlier, you have this above and below the line thinking. Or below the line, you have all of the software and all of the computers running. And above the line, you have all of the people. And all of the people, everyone has a different conception of how the software below the line works. And had Norse had money, and we had all come in on Monday to work, we probably would have had a postmortem. Now, when I say postmortem, most of you are thinking about, you know, someone's like, oh, okay, I'll do the postmortem. They stand up in front of the meeting and they go, the incident started at this time and the incident ended at this time and involved these services. And, uh, I know, like, some hipster startups have nap rooms. The rest of us just have postmortem meetings. And instead of that, Instead of just kind of listing off a, a, a static timeline of everything that happened, look into postmortems as a way of thinking, what surprised you? What was interesting? What was different? Where did our conception of how the system worked differ from, well, reality? Because if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't have gone down. I hesitate to call what we are doing at Norse release engineering, because I think that kind of besmirches every release engineer out there. But what does this look like when it goes right? What does this above-the-line thinking 
about the humans in the system look like when you apply it to release engineering at a company that has, you know, customers. And to that, we need to go to my previous job at Slack. Now, Slack does uh, IRC, but in the cloud. Uh, I think it's really cool. They're going to take off someday. And before I joined, releases were really slow. Nobody likes slow releases. You know, nobody likes watching a progress bar slowly creep across the screen, and you're sitting there going, there's so many things I could be doing right now that are better. And so the release engineering team had sat down and done a lot of work to make releases fast. And they were. It was pretty good. You would get your code merged into master, push a button, and 60 seconds later, your code would be running on every server at Slack. That's a lot of servers, which is really effective. But 60 seconds later, your code, for better or worse, would be running everywhere. So let's go back to that question I asked, what are the humans doing? As it turns out, not much. What people were doing is clicking the button, and as it deployed, they'd go start doing something else. They had OKRs to work on, and KPIs, and TLAs, and SLOs, and all sorts of management speak for continue working. They didn't have time to babysit deploy after deploy after deploy. In fact, uh, one story is, I heard is about someone who was out at lunch, pulled out their phone, pressed deploy, put their phone away, continued eating lunch as all of Slack burned down behind them. <laughs> A bunch of you are suddenly realizing why Slack was so flaky. And in fact, once again, look mom, I made the news. <sighs> Something had to change. And this is actually, I joined the release engineering team at Slack a week before this article was posted. So out of the frying pan into the fire. And so something needed to change. So we could just come up with a policy that says, you know, everyone only deploy good code. Don't deploy bugs. And that would not have worked. Instead, we needed to think about this above below the line. If you look above the line for the deploy process at Slack, where are the humans? They aren't there. They're off doing other things. So we need someone in the loop to handle the weird. And we came up with a new role called the deploy commander. And a lot of companies have a role like this. It's someone who sits there for four hours and just babysits deploys. It is not a fancy great job. But honestly, to credit the humans at Slack, a lot of people volunteered for this. Volunteered to sit there and watch graphs for four hours straight. And this worked. This was good. We were able to have someone in the loop as we deployed. We didn't deploy 100% uh, immediately anymore either. We were able to say, all right, let's deploy it a little bit and have a human watch. So when things get weird, they can go, oh, right, Jane was working on that feature. Let me ping Jane and make sure that she, she knows what's happening here. And then, oh, OK, so that's normal. We can move forward. Or maybe it's not normal, and I hit the big red button. So this worked, and things improved a lot. Uh, customer service actually let us know and said, thank you. We have had, for the first time, no tickets in a morning, and we're able to finally like relax. We finally put a human in the loop. But things weren't perfect there. There was, we, there was a lot of things. You know, deploying a product like Slack, there's a lot going on. And so we wrote up this huge document detailing every single thing you needed to do every single time you deployed. Looks something like this. Let's all read that for a quick second. What was your favorite part? Mine's the fourth page. <laughs> And what had happened was, you know, some diligent humans signed up and got on the deploy commander rotation and read the whole thing. Good for them. Then they went through and deploy commanded for four hours and then went back to their regular day job. Then, remember I said a lot of people signed up for this, two, three, four weeks later, they'd come back. Can a software system change a lot in four weeks? No, right? No, nobody, nobody makes any changes in a whole month. There's a whole bunch of changes that all went on during that four weeks. They'd come back. They wouldn't read the document again. I read that last time. And then go through, and things did not work out. We had one outage with search where new, in, uh, new messages weren't being indexed. You could search for old messages after the uh, before the bug, but after the bug, you couldn't search for anything. So the deploy commander went and tested search. 
good. And they searched for an old message, which they found, and said, this looks good to me. Let's push it out. It went out, and then everyone on Twitter got mad, as usual. But this time, they were mad at us. And so they had tested search. Did they test search exactly according to the document? No. The document could have been better. But instead, what we decided is maybe humans aren't great at repetitive, boring tasks. Is there anything we do that, that, that's really good at repetitive, boring tasks? Right, computers. So we needed to take all of this and put it into a computer. And what we ended up with was just checklists. Checklists are awesome. NASA does checklists. You should do checklists. What that meant was the deploy commander's job was not to read and nearly memorize this huge document. Their job was to handle the weird. And so what they were able to do is sit down. What had changed over the four, uh, past four months? It's going to be a checkbox. They'll know about it. And so they can go through and say, all right, I tested everything according to the latest standards. Teams that come to us, we want to change the standards. Great. Next deploy, they'll go out. And then what this meant was that no one went, oh, shoot, I was supposed to test something two steps ago. Do we need to undo it or redo it? Or is anyone mad at me? Ah! Instead, the humans could handle the weird, and computers handled everything else. <clears throat> All right. So there we have uh, above the line, below the line thinking. And I really hope that you can take this and bring it back to your company to build more resilient systems by making sure that the humans are involved and know what's happening below the line. I'd like to end with this picture of my blender at home. You notice there's a notch in the lid. There's only one way to put the lid of this blender on. I don't need a sign on my wall telling me how to use my own blender. So when you're building software systems, remember to build the notch, and above all, ask, what are the humans doing? Thank you. All right, thank you, Randall. Um, let's kick it off with some questions. Does anyone have any? Hi. Uh, yeah, so I work on a team that's got quite a few big components. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And we do quite a few weekly releases. Um, and so like you mentioned, we have release commanders that go and go through and they, they kind of uh, go through the release docs. Um, and I, I can definitely see the value of checklists. And I've, I've done that in jobs gone past. Really good. Um, but how do you mitigate when something goes wrong? So I, we have like an FAQs uh, section, right? So. Could that also kind of be moved into a more um, human-friendly uh, way to tackle that? So instead of panicking and putting a message out on Slack. Um, um, I mean, sending that? messages on Slack, you can panic and do that. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the, the key qualities of a good deploy commander for us was just knowing people and being able to, to know when to reach out. I think that FAQs are great, but humans are, we're just really good at going just identifying problems and, and, and jumping in to get them. Uh, I think that, you know, like that's a, you see these AI ops and they're like, oh, AI is just this, this list of things to handle situations you already knew about. But that's not what we tackle. That's not resilience engineering. It, they're unexpected errors. Uh, so I think being able to clearly say, like, these are the changes that are going out. These are the people who are responsible for those changes. Super helpful. I know who to contact to say, like, is this normal? Because I might say this huge spike, and someone say, oh, yeah, that, that happens every time. Cool. Thanks very much for the talk. Well, thank yeah, you for showing up. That's a really good, really good point, Randall. I mean, checklists are good for training purposes, but after a while, you probably don't even need the checklist anymore. And it's like, you know, not relying on it mm -hmm. too much, step by step, that's when you get into problems, right? But trusting the human to go a step beyond the checklist. Cool. Who else has a question? More questions. Awesome. <laughs> uh, great entertaining talk. Uh, quite informative. Thank you. If you, um, how much better do you think you'd do now if you went back to some of these 
car wreck stories you told us about, um, and we're faced with the same situation again? That is a really good question. Um, and to answer that, I'm going to talk about video games. Uh, I used to play Overwatch uh, a lot. It's a 6v6 first-person shooter. And you know, I was not very good at it. And I'd ask my friends who were really good at it and show them, like, hey, there's this situation. How should I have handled it? You know, that all of a sudden, three people are coming at me, and I didn't have any backup. And they'd say, well, let me rewind the video a bit. And a minute ago, you went that way. You're never going to be able to handle the situation over here. You need to understand the, all the things that led up to that situation. Uh, and there's, there's a whole bunch of decisions I had made throughout the entire game that really led up to that uh, situation. So you could never say, like, oh, this is the issue. Uh, and so I think one of the changes I would have made is never joining those companies in the first place. Uh, <laughs> uh, to, to be honest, you know, there's, there's a, a couple the giant red flags. It was early on in my career. I didn't learn to identify them. Um, I think, and I explicitly give this advice out now, like if you are new to the industry, do not join a small startup. There is no mentorship available. That, not to say like, that's a, a bad thing. They just don't have time. To, to provide that mentorship, and you, you will grow slower, and I grew slower because of that, and I wasn't able to handle all of the things that went wrong. So early on in your career, you know, now that I'm, I'm further on in my career, what would I have done differently uh, at those companies? I think, you know, honestly, one of the biggest things and problems there was people, um, because you know, computers are easy. And I think there's a lot of situations that I handled personally wrong uh, because I thought I was right and I thought being right was all that was needed and I didn't know how to build a consensus and I didn't know how to talk to people and meet them, uh, meet their needs rather than just going, my way is the right way. So does that answer your question? Hi, thanks. Very useful. Uh, obviously, Everyone is a user, right? Mm -hmm. from, from this perspective, it felt like more dev experience and uh, ops experience because those were internal users. And what I didn't get the answer for and what uh, your original question why I came to this talk was uh, I was hoping to see some techniques how to conceal disasters from public <laughs> <laughs> using user experience. Uh, using user experience, I think that there's a, a lot of wonderful things in that area. There's, um, what I was hoping to do is to talk about um, how to make things useful so that people in your company build more resilient products. Because you know, we've all worked in feature factories where it's just Jira, 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 go. Uh, and so making things easier can help increase adoption. Um, as far as people using your product, when things die, there's of course, when things die, you can just have, well, you know, it's a blank page. Everything's dead. But there's a lot of great tools you can use. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, Slack is a great example in this area of, of dealing with, all right, there's no connection, or there's a slow connection, or there's a flaky connection. And Slack knows the Slack client can figure out each, each situation and will respond differently. So if you have the Slack client open and you don't have any Wi-Fi, uh, and it's, and you're, for whatever reason, your internet is dead. Uh, it'll tell you that. It says, hey, we, we're trying to reconnect. That's a problem. But you can still read messages. It's still as useful as it can be. And caching, same with, with Flaky. There's, there's fallback systems where you know, if the WebSocket doesn't work, let's just try polling and just keep trying uh, through a Flaky connection on your cell phone or whatever. So if you want to hide, or like, maybe not hide disasters, because I'm not a huge fan of being like, everything's fine here, nothing to see here, you know, move along. Uh, but being able to you know, have that sort of progressive degradation of your product, it doesn't, it's not either up or down. Like you can have issues and anticipate those issues in your product because believe me, uh, Wi-Fi is more like li fi sometimes. Thanks. Any other questions? Simple question. So we are using Slack for like release management. Whenever something's wrong, we inform the Slack to the point that, like I don't remember one or two years ago, when the Slack was not working, we stopped release process. So what did you use to? So you worked in Slack. So if Slack didn't work, what did you use to communicate to other people? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so fun fun fact about Slack is 
the release process is the, the first servers that get new code are the servers that run the internal Slack Slack. So any problems are our problems first, and hopefully we notice them before all of you do. And uh, so we have, if that goes down, um, we have already a, a Zoom call going for deploys. It's just always on. We don't need to start a Zoom call. It's there. Uh, if you have coding going, going out, it should be on the Zoom call. And so we can immediately have everyone involved already there. For really big, bad outages, uh, Google Hangouts, although that, that's not as good as Slack. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's a really good question, and um, Laura McGuire is talking later today in this track about the cost of coordination during incidents, because a lot of times when your primary communication mechanism is down, you actually have no idea where to talk, which, which elongates the incident. Um, uh, cool. Any other questions? I have one question just for, for y'all. Um, how many of you ask this question in your incident reviews or your postmortems? Like, what were the humans doing? What were the engineers at the company doing? Does anyone feel like they, they do that well in their postmortems? Yeah, not not a lot of hands, but it's a it's a big part of the system, as Randall pointed out today. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. Let's give another round of applause. For